If not, I'd like to uh, start the panel panel discussion, and we have four of our our members who make up the make up the panel. All all four were uh, grew up here in in Southport. Uh, Catherine Catherine Huffam, um, Mike uh, Mike Royal, Donnie Joyner and Mary Ellen Poole. What we're going to, going to do is ask each, each one of them to introduce them, themselves. And uh, in their introduction, they're going to be talking about their, you know, the, as a young, what their life as a young child and then also as a, as a grown up. But we're going to save the school, the school years um, where they got into all kinds of mischief and stuff. We're going, to, we're going to save that for the, for the full panel panel discussion. So I'd like to start with, with, with Catherine, please. Well, I'm Catherine Huffam. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't born at Dozier. That was my mother's fault. She had me at New Hanover, but I got back to Southport as quickly as I could. <laughs> so um, I grew up in Southport, attended Southport High School and Elementary School. Um, I went to Fort Johnston Academy, which was a private school and later went to Peace College in Raleigh and graduated from Mount Olive College later in life. Um, give me another question, Bob. <laughs> memories for you. What's your first memory of childhood memory? Playing with my friends on my birthday party, <laughs> on my third birthday party. Okay. And what, kind, what was Christmas like? What, what kind of celebration did, you, did the family have? We always had a big Christmas celebration at my grandparents' house on the corner of Nash and um, House Street, which is now being renovated. Um, my Aunt Sally was, was a fashion designer and um, illustrator in Washington. So when she came home, we were the only grandchildren and nieces and nephews at the time. So it was like double Santa Claus. <laughs> so we always had big meals, and lots to celebrate. Okay. I just, I just want to mention that to, to Catherine and her her mother, uh, Miss Miss Trudy, uh, have donated to the to the society over over the years some really wonderful artifacts and and photograph uh, collections from uh, from their 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 family, and it's really much much appreciated. Thank you. We're happy um, to get. <laughs> thanks. Okay. Mike Royal, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Okay, I'm Mike Royal. I was born at uh, J. Arthur Dozier Memorial Hospital there in Southport in August of 1955. Uh, we lived in a little house down on the river. Uh, it's still there to this day. Uh, I believe George Willis lives in that house now. It, it used to be part of the quarantine station in terms of the, the land side of it. Uh, we then moved to over on Rhett Street at the site of the former WBNS uh, railroad station. It's the corner of Moore Street and Rhett Street. Uh, a house had been built there. And that's really where I have memories growing up there. And, you know, like with probably most children, uh, your world continues to expand. And of course, my first memories, or I couldn't leave the, the yard, I was, in, I was allowed in the backyard to play. And uh, we had a big, tall, white picket fence, and I could look through the slats. And I remember my first friend was Rodney Melton, who lived about two houses down, and I could see through the backyards. And of course, he reminded me that I used to holler, hey, boy. Hey, boy, you want to come play? And of course, that's how I met Rodney. Rodney was probably one of my earliest childhood friends, and we all grew up on the block there. A um, bunch of us kids in that area, Jerry Dillsaver across the street on Red, um, Linda Hart, Renee Horn, Hilger, and all the Melton children's, Barbara, Johnny, and Diane, and Rodney, and Kelly Johnson lived on the block, and you know, back in those days, uh, you know, you played all the time with your friends in the neighborhood. We were all over the place. So 
of course, the river was only a block away. So when I got old enough to, to be allowed to go to the river, that's what I was drawn to. Okay. So that, that's it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mike, what about, what about uh, your grown-up grown up life? Well, uh, grown-up life, uh, you know, as, as things work out, as you build your career, it drew, it drew me away from South Court, not necessarily because I, I wanted to, but because that's the necessity when you're, you know, you're trying to provide uh, for your family. But I ended up out here in Austin, Texas, but um, Southport is still home. It always will be. Okay. Catherine, do you want to speak about your, your grown-up life? I think we missed, missed that. Well, that's fine. <laughs> it was exciting. Um, I had a lot of friends. <laughs> we roller skated. My best friends growing up, the girls were me. Um, well, Libby Walton, um, Joan Bomer, Mary Tomlinson. The four of us were kind of together all the time. We read a lot of Nancy Drew mysteries, so we were always trying to solve crimes in Southport. <laughs> and we were snooping around yards when we weren't snooping <laughs> yards at night. <laughs> Just being Nancy Drew and all the other characters. But it was, it was a fun life. In the summer, we took art lessons, um, swimming lessons. We went to the beach. Um, we hung out on the rocks in front of the garrison. The thing to do was to take a picnic lunch on low tide and stay out um, on the rocks until the high tide came in and left because we didn't want to put our feet in the water <laughs> because back then the, the sewage was linked into the, um, the river. So <laughs> that was why we stayed on the rocks, but it was fun. We went to the beach, we played, we rode our skateboards, bicycles, and before we were had our driver's license, we would take the ferry over and spend the day. We'd take our bikes over and hang out on the beach and have picnics. So it was fun. I have a question for Catherine. Uh, Catherine, during your Nancy Drew uh, period, did you ever solve the mystery of who was ringing Ruth Hood's doorbell? <laughs> no. <laughs> But it wasn't me. It might, have been, it might have been a little kid that lived on the block with her. It might have been you. <laughs> a confession to me. <laughs> That's funny. Mary, Mary Ellen, would you like to? Okay. Um, thank you. Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to speak tonight about growing up in Southport. And I don't know how many can see... Um, can see me, but I did a virtual background uh, because I'm uh, because I grew up on the at the yacht basin. I put a virtual background of uh, one of my father's uh, charter boats because that is uh, so much a part of of me growing up in my younger years. Um, I am Mary Ellen Watts Pool, and I'm a native of Southport. And I grew up. Uh, I was born at Dozier Hospital as well. Uh, I grew up uh, where we lived was uh, in the Yacht Basin area. We lived at the end of West Street. It was the corner of West and Bay Street, and both of them were dead ends. And if you know where the Harborside condos are now at Southport Marina, that's where our house was. Uh, all of us, uh, as we get older and even growing up, we have, or I think most people relate uh, what was special about them when they were born or, or how you can relate it to. I always knew I was special for two reasons. There's <laughs> just me and my brother in the family. I was born on his sixth birthday. So he got to name me as six years old. So I always knew I was special because I was born on his sixth birthday. And so uh, I was my big brother's birthday sixth birthday present. <laughs> the other thing about being special is I was born the year that Hurricane Hazel hit Southport. I was nine months old when it hit in October of 1954. Um, my father was in the charter boat business with his dad. 
Uh, so you will see that uh, I put the, one of the charter boats in my background. So the Yacht Basin for me and my brother and my cousins, who we all kind of lived together in that area, and the neighborhood children, the Yacht Basin was our playground. That's where we played. And uh, as a friend of mine says, you know, we really had a childhood like Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer. How wonderful it was. Uh, my early years uh, were spent with those children and we would always go down to the, uh, to the docks and we would go crabbing. We would go uh, and, and uh, one the, some of the fish houses would give us a fish head. We'd tie it on a string and we'd go down on the docks and we would crab or fish off of those docks. And that was one thing we liked to do. We also had picnics. We liked to go to the edge of the marsh down around the Yacht Basin. Uh, a lot of it's been filled in now, but there was a lot of marsh. And we liked to play on the edge of that marsh and uh, have picnics in that area. One of our favorite pastimes is that we would go do what we call mud bogging. At low tide, we would walk out, we would go down on, on the, at the Yacht Basin, and where the tide was low, there would be mud there. And so we would walk real fast on that mud in the hopes that we didn't sink and get stuck. So that was entertainment for us, and this was at, as a young child. Um, we spent a lot of time at the docks when the boats would come in in the summer when they did uh, charter boat fishing when they come in. That was the excitement to go down to for my family. Uh, as small children, we'd go down to the, the docks and wait for the boats to come in. Uh, my brother and the neighborhood boys would go down there as they got older and clean fish and, from the parties that, that caught fish during the day. And that's how they made money in the summertime. Uh, and I do want to say something uh, about the, the fishing business that was always exciting. And um, I do have a picture, and if you will bear with me, I'm going to try to put it on so folks will know what I'm talking about. Okay, if you can see it, let's see. This, this, is, this is the fish that the parties uh, uh, caught during one day on the boats. That's my grandfather in the lower corner and my dad is in the upper uh, corner on the other side. Uh, the fish that they have on the racks are sailfish. People love to come down and try to catch a sailfish because that was a big sport is to fight that huge fish with a reel and bring him in and it was so exciting. Some people they only wanted to try to catch a sailfish because what they would do is then have that fish mounted and hang it on their wall. And when the sail is opened up, it's, it's really beautiful. And when they, the boats come in, if a boat caught a sailfish during the day, one of the men would take his white handkerchief and they would do it up on the line of the boats. So the people, as they come into uh, to the docks at the end of the day, uh, people would see that they had that white handkerchief up there and they would know that they caught a sailfish during the day. So everybody was happy. The, the, the kids down there were happy to see those big sailfish and because uh, they were huge. They were huge, but they were even more huge to us. Uh, and they were beautiful. The sail was beautiful. And the people who went fishing were happy because they caught one. And the, the captains and the mates on the boats were happy. Uh, that is it about my childhood. As I got older, uh, I did stay in Southport. I was fortunate enough to find a, a job where I didn't feel like I had to leave. Uh, I was able, uh, I went to college at uh, UNCW, so I didn't have, have to leave home. So I went to UNCW and also Webster and Myrtle Beach to get my uh, graduate degree. So I never ventured far from home for that purpose. I did uh, have in recent years to travel just for fun, but not to live. Uh, I did work for the federal government for 39 years. I have a 39 year career and uh, I work at Military Ocean Terminal Sunny Point. And I always say that I had the opportunity to live anywhere in the world that I wanted to with my job. And I always decided I would stay in Southport. So that's what I have and thank you very much. And I Perfect. look forward answering some group questions with uh, 
Catherine and Mike and Donnie. Thank, thank you, Mary Ellen. That was great. That was great. Thanks very much. Yes, sir. Uh, Donnie Joyner, do you want to pitch in now? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Now we can see you too. All right. Well, mine. Well, thank you. Uh, my when I'm a refugee from Wilmington, North Carolina, but <laughs> I grew up here in Southport. I lived on Jabba Town Road, which is a uh, different altogether. <clears throat> the games we played growing up as a kid was baseball and football on the highway. And that was very fun because you had a lot of fun to watch out for the cars <laughs> as well as everything else. Now, some of the things I remember, Hurricane Hazel, I was five years old when Hurricane Hazel hit. I remember going to uh, BC, everybody's house, mostly uh, blacks where I grew up at, we had shotgun houses. Anybody familiar with a shotgun house? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Donnie, I'm, I'm familiar house. with that term. Okay, a shotgun house, you can look from the front door straight through the back. Uh, mm -hmm. They're very prevalent down in Louisiana. Because when someone is chasing you, you can go out the front, run through the front, through the back, get on the boat, and get away. Uh, but uh, one of the things I most remember is when the battle, we were, uh, I'm checking my notes, by the way. I was 11 years old, almost 12, and we were down on the waterfront. And uh, Mrs. Francis, Annie Francis, and Eva Lee had us down there, the, uh, I think it was sixth and seventh grade, and we were singing Carolina, Carolina. Well, can you imagine uh, a bunch of 11 and 12 year old kids, especially boys, we were trying to hide. Uh, that was one of the things, there's so many things that I can remember growing up, it take too long. Uh, uh, growing up in Southport was an experience. I grew up, like I said, on Jabba Town Road. Some of the people that I hung out with was Steve Clemens, Greg Clemens, and Milton McCracken. Steve and Greg were cousins of mine, and Milton uh, was a good friend of mine. Later on, we were joined by some of my younger cousins, along with a young man named Billy Floyd, and there was a little blind kid named Charles Drew that uh, we hung out together. And they also played football. The baseball and football for a while was played on the highway. Uh, growing up at BCT, I started, uh, I actually went 11 years because I got lucky. I missed the second grade, uh, but I ran into the third grade, Miss Estelle Swain, a teacher. Bob, you wouldn't have had to put up that Pledge of Allegiance because if you didn't know it, she would give you a good tanning. So I know the Pledge of Allegiance front and back. Uh, all my other teachers were, uh, let's see, one that, uh, Miss Annie Francis, uh, she was one of my favorite teachers. And then there was Anthony Davis in high school. And from after high school, I went to Cape Fear Tech, which is now Cape Fear Community College. Uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, okay. Uh, I plugged up the uh, the uh, the switched into it, and then all of a sudden it got worse because it even cut me off. So I apologize if it keeps going in and out. It's located where I'm at. Sometimes it's sort of bad. It'll come in and it'll go out. So uh, forgive me for that. And I uh, see, uh, I left Southport in 72 for a short period of time. I went to Texas, California, and a few other places. I came back. Uh, Southport is a, a very intriguing place. And it's a place that anyone who's ever lived here will want to come back because when Brian and Root moved here in the 70s, a good portion of the people that worked at their nuclear plant Texas wound up staying here. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And like I said, uh, forgive me if it cuts in. I tried plugging it up and it got worse. Can't hear you, Bob. Oh, 
All right. Well, I have I have some questions. Bob, real quick, can All I? All right, go ahead. Since I was the first one, I wasn't really prepared. <laughs> I okay, did want to say I, I grew up on Atlantic Avenue in the house that Susie Carson bought after we moved out of that house. My first job out of college was a legal secretary, and I worked with Susie Carson for five years. So <laughs> I had quite a connection with her. Um, and then I worked with Carolina Power and Light for 16 years and then uh, worked with Liberty Home Care in Wilmington as their personnel and safety rep and nurse recruiter, worked for Dozier for five years and became a realtor. And that's been the last 15 years of my life. So. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, you mentioned, mentioned Susie Carson and you're re reminding me that I saw um, on, on, I believe it was on Facebook, that this year, 2020, would be Susie Carson's 100th uh, birthday. And it's, uh, I believe it was like May, May 20, 22nd. So mm -hmm. it's right around this, this time. Uh, so Susie was the co-founder of the society. And uh, the other co-founder was a woman by the name of El Eleanor Smith that mm -hmm. you know uh, well. Uh, May 24th, uh, just a couple days from Susie's, would have been Eleanor's 98th uh, mm -hmm. uh, birthday. I just just wanted to mention our our co-founders on their on their birthdays. Um, I don't remember the exact date, but at the sometime in the mid 70s, uh, early yeah, around 76, 77, when they started the society. Is that right? 70, 76, the bicentennial year. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, just, you, you did, each of you did talk a bit about your uh, early, early school years. Um, for the folks who went to Southport High School, can you explain to us how you started high school in the first grade? <laughs> I mean, Catherine, you're up. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll have to go first. Uh, I went there in the first grade. It was uh, grades one through 12, and it was special. And I was so excited because after, um, after the sixth grade, we, the junior high was upstairs. And you really had, it was, it was very special to be up there with the, the high school students. And unfortunately, that year, the school burned. So my dreams were went up in smoke. But Mike was in my, we were in a seventh and eighth grade combination that year. And Annie Francis was our homeroom teacher and our Glee Club director. And um, after Southport High School burned, then we integrated with um, Brunswick Training School and it became Brunswick County Southport High School. I think that was the name of it before South Brunswick was open. Okay, uh, Mike. Mike Royal, what's your explanation of that whole that whole period? Can you hear me, Mike? You need to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, going to school at Southport High School is is a wonderful memory. Uh, I, like Catherine said, I was always fascinated by the high school kids upstairs. And, you know, you had your, your in elementary school, we were all downstairs, and you always kind of dreamed of that day you could go upstairs, you know. Other than being sent upstairs on a few errands, you know, it was like foreign territory, very unique. And um, I really enjoyed it. And, I, you know, like I, I, I've mentioned before, uh, my first grade teacher was uh, Miss Norman, and that she was also my mother's first grade teacher. And um, you know, so there was a lot of lot of history and a lot of uh, things that got passed on from year to year. And um, and then of course, you know, we did get to go upstairs in junior high, but it was kind of a brief encounter because the school burned in in January of 1969. And, you know, we all probably have memories of going down there. I stood across the street between the Methodist Church and the Masonic Hall 
watching the firefighters try to fight the blaze, hearing shotgun blasts go off where a member was trying to keep the windows from blowing out onto the firemen. He was going ahead and pre, um, pre-shooting out the windows. And it was, uh, it was really a, kind of a traumatic experience. And then after that, they had to decide what to do with us. And, you know, we went to the Baptist church. There were some, some small classroom buildings that weren't connected to the school. Some of us were in there. Some went over to the Baptist assembly to go to school. And then they finally settled it by the next year, I guess, which was the school year of 1970, where Brunswick County Training School was able to accept all the Southport High School students over there. Um, it just, uh, Southport High School also was very proud uh, with their sports. They seemed to have a lot of basketball championships and things like that. So, um, this is what we really grew up in South they Park. played eight man football or, or maybe it was nine man football. I don't remember now, but it was not a full football team because they didn't have enough, uh, they didn't have enough going out for the football team to have 11 players. So, okay. next. Okay. Mary Ellen? <laughs> Okay, um, of school, I went to uh, Southport High School when I started school too, but I can tell you, I was not excited like Catherine and Mike were. I did not <laughs> want to go to school. Uh, Miss Mary Lee Norman was my teacher, and since I was the youngest of the family of cousins and my brother, uh, I was the youngest, and they all let me know that when I went to school, I was going to, uh, Miss Norman was going to straighten me out and that she would be spanking me and uh, I would be a different child. Uh, so I did not want to go. So for <laughs> my mother said it was probably about eight or 12 weeks. Every morning when she took me to school, I cried. I cried, uh, sorry, I cried until I threw up every morning. And my brother who was now 13 had the job of taking me to the door. And he would take me to the door and tell me, okay, now go in, quit crying, and you need to stay here. Well, I would scream and cry and follow him down the hall, screaming his name. So I know he was mortified, but that was what, uh, how I was in the first grade. But after a while, I decided I would like it. And uh, after that, it was good. Miss Norman always said that I was the only child, and by the way, she taught Mike's Mike and his mom. She taught my dad as well. She said I was the only child she had ever had that she thought could make it in Hollywood because <laughs> at that time they didn't have the term drama queen, but I think that's what she meant about me. But even as, uh, as an adult, I would see her and she'd say, oh, here comes Mary Ellen. You're the only child I ever thought could make it in Hollywood because you sure put on a show when you would come to my classroom in the first grade. So um, I went through, through uh, the years at, at Southport and then when I was a freshman is when the school burned. And like Mike said, all of, this, all of the town stood around while that school burned and watched it and it was a very emotional. Um, we had, uh, I was a freshman in high school and the rest of the year, the high school went, took classes at the Baptist Church in Southport. And then the next year, we, we were combined. And that's where I finished school there. Uh, I also, uh, I'm going on off on another tangent because we went to a lot of basketball games and, and football games, mainly basketball. But uh, I remember also for Donnie, uh, his school growing up, when I was real young, they had a band, and when they would practice in the afternoon, a lot of the town's people would go and sit and park and wait for that marching band to come by to listen to them play. So I can remember even before I was in school, my mother would put me and my brother and my cousins uh, in the car, and we'd, we'd go somewhere and park and wait for the band to come by so they could, we could watch them practice. Uh, because they were a marching band, and it was uh, it was pretty exciting for me. And I guess that's all I have. Thank you. And I thank never skipped school, Bob. So don't ask that. 
<laughs> Much to that, I'm sure the, uh, uh, okay, Donnie, uh, you went to BCT. Was, was BCT also first grade to, to 12th grade? Yes, yes it was. Now you gotta remember one thing, in 1960, uh, school year, they changed the name from BCT to BCH, Brunson mm -hmm. County High School. Okay. <clears throat> so they, they changed the name then. Mm -hmm. so, so what was it like being in elementary school with all those big kids around you? Well, it was I saw like Southport High. Southport High had upstairs. We were on the southern end of the school, and the kids, the high school kids, was on the northern end. Can you hear me, Bob? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we were on the uh, southern end. They were on the northern <clears> end. <throat> but the thing that struck fear in most elementary students was Miss Estelle Swain. Had nothing to do with high school. We could handle high school. Miss Estelle Swain was the one. <laughs> that, that lady did not play at all. And I, I tell you, she was a third grade teacher. And what happened, 15 of us, including Judy Gordon, were sent <laughs> to the third grade classroom because the second grade was so large that year. And after we saw how she did those third graders, we decided, at least 10 of us, that we were not going back in another year. So that's why we were able to skip the second grade right to the fourth. <laughs> One year from Mrs. Del Swain, that was enough. <laughs> and yeah, uh, like I said, I apologize. I'm going to have to try to figure something out because whenever I'm on Zoom, sometimes the connection works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but, uh, did, did you I say you had that Ethernet cable in? Uh, it was basically, I guess, it's sort of like Southport High. I had it in, and then it just clicked everything out, so I had to take it back out. That's, that's too bad. Did you hear me, Bob? Yeah, I did, Donnie. Donnie. Sorry, you're having that. What I said was having that problem. Um, let's go. Let's go back to Catherine. Yeah, I think. Where it is because uh, we're still doing. Catherine and everybody, I just have I have a couple kind of like uh, uh, starter good. questions, if if you will. Like Catherine, what's the funniest thing that ever happened happened to you? Uh, while you were in, in school? The uh, funny? Yeah. <laughs> when I was in Girl Scouts, Mary Tomlinson, Joan Bomer, Libby Walton, and I left the Methodist Church, which is where we had our uh, meetings. And Southport High School was directly in front. And Annie Weeks, who was Mike's aunt, I believe, is that right, Mike? That's right. Um, she was my she was our fourth grade teacher. I think Mike was in my fourth and fifth grade combination. But we looked outside and the only two cars we saw at the school were Miss Annie Weeks' car and Miss Lingle's car. And we were scared of Miss Lingle and we were being the Nancy Drew girls. So we, <laughs> we walked across the street and you could climb up on the side of the building and look in the classroom and Miss Weeks wasn't there. And the coat closet was directly behind the classroom, and it had a window as well. And her pocketbook and her coat were there. And we just knew that Miss Lingle, Lingle had hurt her in some manner. So we ran around to the cafeteria and we got Miss Maisie Willis and Miss Mammy St. George to open the door for us so we could run down the hall and scream for Miss um, Weeks. We were scared something had happened to her. And here comes Miss Lingle with a broom. And she chased us down the hall. We ran in the girls' bathroom and hid up on the toilets with the door shut. And finally <laughs> she left. Well, we just knew, uh, we went back through the cafeteria. We beat on the door for Miss Maisie to let us back out. We knew the next day we were gonna go to the principal's office and get a paddling because that's what Miss 
Lingle would have sent us <laughs> to. So Libby was so upset about it, she couldn't even go to school the next day. But we got back to school and Miss Weeks smiled at us and hugged us and told us that she was very appreciative that we loved her so much. <laughs> so <laughs> it was embarrassing and funny at the same time. Yeah, very, very nice. Uh, Mike Royal? Um, so I have a story that's kind of embarrassing, but ends up being a little funny. Um, it was uh, in first grade with Miss Norman. Um, we were allowed to go to recess, but we had to play again between the Methodist Church and between the Masonic Hall. And we were given strict instructions not to go around the Masonic Hall on the side where the park was located. Well, you know, you're out there and you're playing, you're playing tag. Next thing you know, you're on the other side of the Masonic Hall. And we all got in trouble. There was probably about seven of us. She marched us into the classroom. She had us standing up at the front. She was going to give us all a paddling. And we're in line. And she goes to look for her paddle. And while she's looking for her paddle, the first boy in line, who was Shelton Kaysen, decided he was going to get out of it if he could by crawling underneath the tables. Now we're in the front of the room and his seat was all the way at the back of the room. He literally crawled under the tables all the way and worked his way back to his <laughs> seat and all of a sudden he pops up in his seat and by that time Miss Norman had found her paddle and came back up and was grabbing the next boy in line and he was trying to get the words out that Shelton had gotten away, but before he could say anything, she started paddling him, and um, nobody, Shelton got away with it. Uh, nobody told on Shelton, and she never called on that Shelton got away with it. So, <laughs> That's um, another Miss Norman story in 1961 was when I was in her class. I won the twist contest, so. I just wanted to let y'all know how good of a dancer I was going back to 1961. Wait, a little chubby checker for you. Exactly. Right. And Mary Ellen? Nothing funny ever happened to you. No, I, don't, I, don't, I can't remember anything funny happening to me. Um, the, probably, uh, um, you asked us the other day what was uh, something embarrassing that happened. I don't know if anything ever embarrassed me, but uh, I guess what one thing I could say that I remember uh, was when I was in high school and some of us decided to skip school and we were going to walk to a friend of ours house whose dad worked um, uh, during the night. So we knew he would be asleep and we knew we could get his car. So we left school and we were going to take walk the back roads to his house. Well, we saw the uh, one of the teachers coming in the student driver car. <laughs> so we didn't want to be caught. So, you know, it, it was uh, close to the school was a real wooded area. This this was at uh, in high school at the location where the community college is now. And there was a lot of woods over there. It wasn't built up like it is now. And I remember we went in those woods and kind of hid. Uh, behind some trees and stuff, but the problem was that I had on a red blouse that day, and so the driving instructor said all he could see was that red blouse, so he <laughs> told me next time, I ne we didn't get in trouble, but he told me the next time I decided to skip to make sure I didn't wear a red blouse, because that <laughs> was easily seen uh, when I tried to hide, <laughs> so I guess that's the only thing I can remember that might be humorous. Okay. Thank you. That I can mention uh, in this forum. <laughs> <laughs> Donnie? Well, Bob, I sort of halfway plead the fifth. There was an incident at my senior year. Uh, a friend of mine was like this girl, and he, he had me write a letter to her. So I wrote the letter. It was on a Sunday, and he winds up giving it to to the girl on Monday by Miss had me in the office. And so first thing I did, I denied it. 
that I didn't write the letter. I don't know nothing about it. And then he told me the gentleman that uh, I wrote the letter for had already told everything that, and to get caught your senior year by Mr. Cabinet, that was an embarrassing <laughs> moment. Uh, and my good friend, I won't miss his name, Charles Moore, I never forgave him for that. But that was probably the worst that I had. Yeah. I'm wondering at this, this point, if there's anybody in the audience that would like to ask the group a, que a question or has a, has, a, uh, has a story of their own to share. No takers on that? Uh, Bob, this is Mary Ellen. I, I would like to say something. Since I've been involved with the Historical Society and, and when I did the coloring thing and, and today, it really makes you think and write about uh, down about how the area looked and how things were when you were younger. And I think it's an excellent time to remind people that that's what you need to do. I, I know everybody has their own special stories and you, you don't really think about them until somebody asks you or you hear somebody else telling a story. So I, I think that uh, this is a good way to tell people, please write down your stories and, and tell your stories and think about them again, even if it's for your own personal uh, use, because it is very important. I know it'll be important to your family and, uh, and others. So that's all I wanted to say. Okay. Thank you, Mary Ellen. There was valuable. I'm glad you said that, Mary Ellen. Hey, Bob. Hey, Bob. Yes. Bob, I was going to add yes, another Sue. thing about. Oh, is that my interference? Go ahead. You're good. I, I was going to add something else about Southport High School. The excitement about that school, there were always festivities. There were May Day festivities. We would wrap the Maypole. We would have dances. Mrs. Lingle was very creative. We performed on the stage in the auditorium. We would have great paper dresses that were like flowers, and we would dance and perform. The whole community came out for that. Um, that was something special for that school because everything in town really centered around the activities at the high school, whether it was from the first or the 12th grade. Um, and back then they had mascots for all the classes, which meant they had little children be with the, the senior class when they graduated. I happened to be a mascot with a little boy named Randy Hahn for the class of 1962. And that was Robert Howard's class and Measy Herring's class. Um, and I got to even go to the junior senior prom with them. And Sally Ward was the May Queen that year and I got to be her flower girl. So when they had the big May Day festivities in front of the school wrapping the flagpole, I got to throw rose petals for her as she walked up the steps of the school and sat in her, on her throne as the May Queen. So it's, it's a lot of fun as a child, a lot of things going on. Hmm. Thank, thank, thank you, Catherine. Um, I have a kind of a combination of questions here for you because we kind of talked about you being in, in, in school. What did you do after school? What did you do on the weekends? What did you do in the summer? Did you have part-time jobs? Uh, did you have chores, chores to do? Um, did you get an allowance and how, how much and how did you spend it? So it's just, you know, what were your out-of-school act activities and your out-of-school life? Are you starting with me again? Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I rode my bike, uh, played on the river. Um, I went to my friend's houses. My mother took us to the beach any day that she could get us there. When we didn't go to Yopon Beach, which was really cool because they had, um, they had a um, pavilion there, basically. Uh, you could rent rafts, get ice cream. There was a, a ski ball, is that what you call it? Um, anything you wanted to do right there on the beach. And if we didn't go to Yopon Beach, we went over to Boiling Spring Lakes to the swimming area, which I think is on Spring Lake Drive or Spring Lake. 
but we took swimming lessons. We took art lessons. We were, we had a fulfilled summer. Um, we traveled. My grandfather's family was from Fernandina, Florida. So we would go there quite often or we would go to the mountains. Um, there was never a dull moment. I did have chores. Um, I don't think I got an allowance, <laughs> but I babysat. I made 50 cents an hour. So <laughs> but that was my summer. You, um, you left out ambassador camp. Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> How did you remember that? <laughs> I went to ambassador camp. <laughs> I went to Ambassador Camp in the summer up at Lake Waccamaw. So a lot of was, us did. What, yeah. what was what was Ambassador Camp? It was a non-denominational camp. Um, I, I went there as a camper, and I also went there and, and worked in the summer. It was volunteer, um, but I loved it there. I had a lot of friends from Whiteville, Elizabethtown, Clinton. A lot of those children came to Ambassador Camp. Because I was Catholic, and this was non-denominational, and um, but they didn't care. <laughs> Catholics yeah, went, were a minority in Southport. I went there too, probably about three years in a row. I, I was never a counselor, but I did go there. Mm -hmm. um, it was fun. It was. Yeah. I learned to water ski there, and um, made lifetime friends there. So, Libby Walton and Stephanie Helms, the three of us would go together. So yeah. we always had a good time. Mike, I, I know you, you mentioned you, you did have a, a, a job or you made, I don't know if it was a regular job, but you, you made money on, on the waterfront. What was tell us what that's about? You know what Mary Ellen mentioned earlier about hanging out uh, the children or the kids when they became of age uh, enough where their parents will let them go down to the river or to the yacht basin. I was one of those kids that was, I stayed down there all summer long and I was one of the ones that cleaned the fish for the party boats. Uh, it wasn't like it was a job because, you know, you had to, you, you never knew if you were going to get a chance to clean the fish because that was up to the parties. Uh, but you would go and you'd stand on the dock when the boats would come in and you would ask, hey, can I, can, can, do you want us to clean your fish? And they would hire you. And I can remember, you know, we kind of broke the fish down into three categories. Uh, bottom fish had a lot of scales, so we charged more for bottom fish. Mm -hmm. uh, more of the fish like king mackerel and Spanish mackerel, you didn't have to scale them, so they were a little cheaper to clean. And then there was the type of fish like what we call the uh, dolphin, but when I say dolphin, it's the fish dolphin. You had to skin that fish to clean it. And so uh, we would, you know, ask to be hired. And this is something that several generations of young boys did uh, the older boys, you know, by the time they got interested in cars and girls, they would leave the yacht basin, and then the younger generation would take over. It was sort of like a, a hierarchy, and you, you never knew if you were going to get a chance to clean for that, for that boat or not. It just depended on if one of your buddies got there first or, or if the party even wanted it, uh, wanted their fish to be clean. And then, of course, you picked up odd jobs. Uh, we might be painting boats. We might be, you know, scrubbing decks. I can remember painting outriggers for the shrimp boats. You know, just different things that you could get hired just for the day, just for day labor and stuff like that. It's just a wonderful experience. It's a wonderful thing to remember all those years. And then, you know, and then in, when it was a high tide, we would go swimming in the yacht basin. We would be diving off the shrimp boats, you know, and just all of us, probably 20 of us guys, and occasionally some of the girls would join in with us. Uh, it was just a fun time. I, you know, I spent every summer, and uh, you mentioned things that we might do after school. I can remember a period of time, based on the timing of it, I would rush home from elementary school to turn on dark shadows the tv show <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And then I'll, then later on, when I was probably about 12 or 13, I actually had a, an evening paper route. I'd deliver papers. And of course, I, I inherited that paper route from Rodney Melty, and Rodney inherited it from Greg Brand. So uh, back in those days, the Wilmington Star News had an evening paper, and we would deliver the paper. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Mary Ellen. Okay. Uh, same question or? Yes, ma'am. Same question. Um, I, let's see. Um, you know, school, uh, Catherine, you know, talked about school and, and all of the activities there. It, it was a community uh, activity, a lot of stuff for people to do uh, in all of the plays and the, the, uh, the singing and, and things we did. Um, in the summer, um, a couple years, I think I worked as a waitress at, uh, at one of the restaurants. Um, I didn't ever get an allowance. Uh, that's kind of it. And so we always stayed close to home. Uh, my father being, you know, working in the fishing business, you know, he worked every day that the weather allowed him to. So we didn't go on vacation. Our vacation was my mother would put me and my brother in the car and, uh, and take us to visit our mother in South Carolina for the weekend. That, that was our vacation. So that's kind of what we did. My mother always said, why would you want to go anywhere? You And uh, my dad was born and raised in Southport, but my mother was from South Carolina. But it was my mother who always told us, uh, you live in Southport. Why would you want to go somewhere else? Nowhere else can be as beautiful as here. And there's always things to do and see. So why do you want to go anywhere else? So we really didn't go anywhere else. Okay. Mr. We did go to the movies and, uh, you know, we went to the Amuse You, but I can tell you that is not my first recollection of a movie. At uh, When I was, before I went to school, I can remember um, one night uh, my, my dad uh, and, uh, my mother's sister's husband, they were babysitting me and my cousin who were very close in age and we weren't in school yet. I think they had a women's club meeting to go to. So they were stuck with babysitting us. And I remember they took us to a movie at the drive-in theater. There was a drive-in theater um, that was in the location on the corner of uh, Long Beach Road where Handy Hugo's is. There was a drive-in movie out there, and mm -hmm. I don't, I'm sure we fell asleep before the movie started, but I can remember the cartoon was Heckle and Jekyll, and that was the first cartoon at a movie that I remember seeing. Uh, I don't remember the first movie I went to that the Amuse You, but I remember that because of, uh, of that we went, uh, it was a drive-in, and uh, Heckle and Jekyll was the cartoon. So that's what, that's a, something I remember. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. That's good. Uh, that's okay, good. Uh, I, I remember that uh, drive-in theater too. I'm glad she mentioned it because it's, it's so long ago that it disappeared. You almost forget about it. Mr. Joyner. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, uh, my dad paid me not to work. I, I know that sounds crazy, <laughs> but uh, we went to the blueberry farm. It's called Grand Blueberry Farm. That's where you now have, have Lowe's food. It was a blueberry farm out there, and, and I believe it was Max had a, a house over there. Mm -hmm. and, and you got paid 50 cents a carrot. And for those who don't know what a carrot is, a carrot is 12 pints of berries, two other pints of berries, that's what they call top it off. So you got 50 cents a carrot. My lunch per week was three or four dollars and I made about a dollar. So my father said, it's easier if I just give you a three dollar allowance and have you not work anymore. I'll save money. <laughs> and so all we did in the summertime was run around the, uh, the woods near Jabbertown Road and played Little League Baseball and things like that. But 
as far as for having a job, I didn't. He said, when you're in school, you better get good grades. So <laughs> that's why I always try to excel in school because, like I said, the job I had, the Berry Farm, I'd already figured it out. I was going to make $10, but after the first day, uh, making no more than a dollar a week. So that didn't work out. <laughs> <to our life. laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, anybody, uh, how, to, how to say this, I've, I've heard it said that there was really only two things you could do in, in Southport and you, as a kid. And, the, you know, you've kind of disproven that all, all, already. But this person who has said this is only really two things you could do. You could go to, you, to the Amuse You or you could create some mischief for your own enter entertainment. Um, Catherine, what kind of mischief did you create? <laughs> well, I didn't do it on my own. <laughs> it was me and Libby and Mary and Joan, and probably my friend Stephanie. Again, we were the sleuths of Southport. And we would sneak out of Libby, we would have a pajama party and we would sneak out of Libby's house. She lived in the house where Dr. Zakowski lives now on the corner of Rhett and um, Bay Street. And Miss Annie Mae Woodside, who I'm sure the Historical Society is familiar with, she lived in the house where Dr. Fortney lives now on Bay Street. And we would sneak out and the thing to do was to sneak through her yard but we just thought it was fun, not that we were going to do anything really bad. It was just to sneak through her yard at night. And one night we were on the fence between her house and Dr. Templin's house because he was out of town. The lights came on and she walked out on her porch with a shotgun. <laughs> and it scared us so bad. The only thing Libby could come up with to say was, Miss Annie May, I'm looking for my cat. He's been missing for about three days. <laughs> and we all ran. <laughs> <laughs> that was our mischief, sneaking through yards. All right, thank you. Uh, Mike, Mike Royal, I, I just don't want to skip you because I'm sure you never did any, anything mischievous. You might as well skip me. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> come on, give it up. Well, I, I did uh, participate in ringing Ruth Hood's doorbell and then going <laughs> hiding in she had a bunch of azalea bushes and I would hide in the azalea bushes and watch <laughs> her come out. But um, she finally caught on to me. One, one time I rang her doorbell and I went and hid in the bushes and she marched right down the steps and walked over there and caught me. You know, <laughs> and I was embarrassed. I apologized and went home. But uh, I was one of many, many young kids that liked to ring her doorbell. Uh, <laughs> so I would do the doorbell ditch and dash, I think is what it was called. And um, Why as far as your doorbell, not anybody else's, um, she, she was a teacher, with, yeah. She was a teacher, was a well known teacher. in the school, uh, well known she in the was school. Tough. <laughs> yeah. She was like Joan Crawford and Mommy Dearest, as, and she kind of looked like her. So. Yeah, that's 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 a good, yeah. Mm -hmm. We were scared. My father had my father had the Exxon or I guess it was Esso Station then, where the golf cart um, sales are on the corner of Leonard and Atlantic. And I can remember every Halloween, my father had to wash Ruth Hood's car because it was egged. I mean, you could, it was a green car, but when he had it in the bay, washing it, it was yellow. <laughs> and it was yeah. every year. It was a lime green 1957 uh, Chevrolet Bel Air. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd like to have that car right now. <laughs> she got, she caught a lot of grief. Yeah, I guess she was a good sport about it, but she was tough. <laughs> so. Yeah, I lived on the same block with her and, you know, sort of got passed down. Well, you know, some of the older boys are doing it, so I ended up following <coughs> her lead. <laughs> <clears throat> Mary Ellen, were you a mischief maker? 
Uh, no, I was not. Okay. <laughs> well, I will say that uh, in, in talking about that, uh, I guess I was in high school though. I wasn't in the younger grades, so it was in high school. Uh, I remember one Halloween, uh, we uh, we toilet papered one of the teacher's houses, and I guess with uh, the shortage of it now, the teacher <laughs> he would have probably loved it if that happened now. But one Halloween, we did toilet paper. Uh, his house, but um, that was kind of it. Well, who's what teacher was it, Mary Ellen? I can't yeah. tell you. I cannot oh. tell you. <laughs> I cannot tell you that. <laughs> there were that many male teachers will deduce it down to. Uh -huh. uh, I'll tell you sometime. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Bishop, Mr. Tell Joyner. My secrets. <laughs> <clears throat> Well, uh, mine was a little different for anybody, especially people in Texas, have heard of a cow chip war. Well, <laughs> my, my cousin Steve and Greg, their grandfather was Sam Jackson, and he had cows. And so every once in a while in the summer, when we got bored playing uh, what we call two-man baseball, because there's only four of us, we would go have a cow chip war. And every once in a while, one of us would get one that was semi-dry. And if you've ever been hit with a cow chip that's semi-dry, you'll know what I'm talking about. And we always did things sort of like that. Uh, we, we had to be a little bit creative because not living in Southport, we were not allowed in Southport, not because we wasn't old enough, is our parents and grandparents wasn't going to let us go that far, so we wound up going over to Mr. Sam Jackson's uh, house, and it's, when you're going down, uh, I think it's uh, 87, 133, it's on the uh, left side, just as you pass the bank, mm -hmm. and the, uh, I think Hardy's, mm -hmm. was out there, so the cow chip, the idea was to get the dry ones, but every once in a while, we get a wet one. And you don't want to get hit with a wet cow chip. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so I understand uh, Bob, the... I do. I, I'm sorry. This Mary Ellen. I do have one story because uh, if, if I don't tell it when I, we get off, my brother will say, why didn't you tell this story? Uh, one of the, uh, I guess it was mischief and I was, I was pretty young. I was uh, not in school yet. When my mother would go to the grocery store, of course I was younger and had to go with her and I remember sitting in the buggy. Well, um, my treat, I always got um, a Coca-Cola, you know, in the South we don't say Coke, we say Coca-Cola. Anyway, I got a Coca-Cola in a little small glass bottle. That was my treat so that I would be quiet and be good while she was able to shop and put her stuff in the car. And you, uh, one of the, there was a, a gentleman who worked at the grocery store and he was stocking the shelves. So he was kind of squatting down. And you know how when a man squats down and he has his shirt tucked in, his belt <laughs> kind of gaps open at the back of his shirt in the back? Well, I poured that Coke in the back of that little tunnel there. <laughs> It, between his belt and his shirt, and my mother said he jumped about 20 feet, and I poured that coke in, so kind of the story, and up until that gentleman passed away, every time he would see me, he would say, I hope you don't have a Coca-Cola with you, but uh, anyway, that I hadn't thought about that till my brother mentioned it the other day, did I remember doing it, and I had to admit I did. But um, that's my story of, I guess things go better with Coke. I guess that's what I thought. <laughs> you, you, you might have got first prize for Mr. Baker. And I, it was <laughs> that's funny. Uh, okay, I want to ask you a question, question. I've heard stories about essentially two, two stores, you know, uh, rest restaurants, and and one is Willie Willie McKenzie's store, and I, I know you probably you all have have good memories of of, of that, 
And, and the other one that you, you know, good memories for sure was the place with the best hamburger in, in town. You know, kind of yeah. you know, talk, talk about it would be at Oliver's, right? uh, I guess. I never had Oliver's hamburger. They're it better was, than little bits? Yes, yes. Oliver's burgers solved every problem you ever had. When I was in the first grade, I had the red measles and I was at Dozier Hospital. And I told my daddy, I said, if you'll just get me a cheeseburger and a chocolate milkshake from Mr. Oliver's, I'll feel a whole lot better. <laughs> it did. And the next day I got out of the hospital and I've always attributed it to that cheeseburger and milkshake. It was the Works best. For me, Catherine, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and really. Willa McKenzie? Pardon? Willa McKenzie's store, did you? Oh, I did. I liked the great um, Icy's. That was one of my favorites to get at Willie McKenzie's. But Dolly Evans had a store on the corner of Brown, um, you know, in the corner of St. George and Howe Street. And she made the best brown dogs you could ever eat. So they were delicious. Mike? Um, the only problem I had with Oliver's was it was closed on Thursday. I wish it was open every day of the week. I, I, I love that place and I could, you could walk in and he'd look at you and he'd go, same thing, Mike. And I'd go, same thing. He knew what I, what I wanted. And then I would walk around behind the counter and open up the cooler and get my sun drop out. Uh, occasionally I did get a chocolate milkshake. He had some of the best milkshakes I've ever, I've ever had. And, um, just a, a wonderful experience, Oliver's Grill. He, he really had a special way of doing it. I don't know if it was a special recipe. One time Rodney Melton shared with me that it was kind of a special recipe and a special cut of ground beef. Um, and, um, it was just, you know, really, really good. And to this day, I compare all hamburgers to that. Well, yeah, some of us have t-shirts that say, I ate at Oliver's Grill. <laughs> I don't know if you can That's see right. that. <laughs> yeah. But there, there was, it closed, it, it opened in 1949 and it closed in 1985. And Boy Spencer, along with some other people, made a sign and hung on the front door. It was like a tombstone. And yeah. it said, here lies Oliver's Grill, born March 21st, 1949, died April 25th, 1985. For 36 years, it held its virginity, a darn good record for this vicinity. Rest in peace. <laughs> <laughs> it was hilarious. I talked with Ed one time, and he told me the story. He said he had graduated with an accounting degree, and he was on his way. He had picked out um, a town in Florida. I can't remember the town now in Florida, but that's where he was going to go and he was going to become an accountant. But he stopped in the Southport and the Oliver's Grill thing was just something he was going to temporarily do just to make a few dollars before he headed on down to, I think it was Pensacola. And, uh, and he said, and I, I've been here ever since, Mike, I never left. And boy, are we glad he didn't, you know, move on down to Florida to do the accounting. Okay. Because Thanks, it, Mike. yeah. Thank you. Mary Ellen? Okay, um, I, I will agree. Oliver's was good. But uh, when I was younger, because we were around the waterfront a lot, uh, Lewis Dixon had a, a restaurant mm -hmm. uh, right there across from where my dad had his charter boats. And uh, we would we would like to go in there and, and get some French fries and uh, or some hush puppies and Max Cafe that was on the water where Oliver's uh, uh, restaurant is today. I remember even at Halloween sometimes if you would go in Max and Lewis's, they'd give you a, a bag with some hush puppies in it uh, for mm -hmm. for trick or treat. And uh, I know sometimes we would go and uh, get a bag of hush puppies 
and uh, they were hot right out, out of the hot grease, and we'd put them in that paper bag, and it'd have grease all on it, and then we'd pour some you know, we this we didn't have uh, Krispy Kreme down the road, so we'd pour sugar in that bag and shake up those hush puppies, and that was like a donut. It's delicious, but uh, I that's what I remember uh, doing at the restaurants. Of course, uh, Oliver's was good, but there were other good restaurants and very good seafood. And one thing I remember about uh, Lewis Dixon is that uh, whatever the uh, the boys, the guys, if they'd go fishing, whatever they caught and cleaned, and if the party didn't want it or if they went fishing, they would take them into Lewis's. And also uh, stuff they, they shot and killed, Lewis would cook it for them. It didn't matter what it was, Lewis Dixon would cook it for you. I remember eating um, probably barbecued uh, raccoon there one time that he cooked for somebody. And... Uh, and the uh, first place I ever uh, ever ate uh, conks was at Lewis Dixon's. So that was kind of fun. Hmm. Thank you, Marilyn. Donnie Joyner, what was your favorite favorite re restaurant or place to go for a treat? Oh, when you're a kid? well, I had a kid. We ate at home. We. <laughs> Uh, restaurant was because his grandson is my second cousin, and so when uh, we'd come to Southport, we'd go over, and my aunt would go over to visit her niece, his mother, and we would go down to Mr. Willie's, and he'd set us up. We call him Sherbet. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Basically, shaved ice. Uh, now, I've eaten hamburger country in different parts of the world. I haven't had a hamburger like that. Hmm. Mm -hmm. so, um, that man, that's a lot to say. Thanks, Donnie. Um, and to add, to... What, to add what Donnie said, Mr. McKenzie, um, his place was on House Street. I believe there is a beauty shop there, but it, it's close to the uh, water tower. He had... Uh, he had a little place in there and you could get ice cream. And my favorite was like Catherine's was a grape sherbet. And he would ask you what he want. He was probably the kindest man, uh, 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 older gentleman I ever met. He was real, um, he was quiet and he was very kind and he would ask you what you wanted. And then he would chip the ice off of a big block of ice with an ice pick. And then he had this huge metal, uh, ice uh, ice crusher that he put it in and I mean it sounded like a a, a, a jet engine going when he chipped that ice up um, and I know he made all of the syrups himself um, but that was a, a good place to go it, it had a, a real great feeling when you walked in the door yeah thank you um, is any, anyone have a have a question for the for the panel? So we're gonna it's it's getting that it's a little bit it's after eight we've been at it for for a solid solid hour or so. Let me ask each of the panel members if they have uh, a, a story that they they wanted to share, but I didn't ask the right the right question. Um, <clears throat> Catherine, do you have another, another, another story you'd like to share? I think what was really, in, in, I think I was in the ninth grade, may have been 10th, Mary Ellen will know, but when they brought the eagle down from the Coast Guard Academy, they brought the, the young, or the cadets down to Southport and they, um, the ship was, what is the right word, moored, um, what do you call it, Mike? You know, <laughs> when they docked, docked, yeah, it was they docked, yeah at, at the city pier. And all of the young girls in Southport who were at least 14 or 15 and above were invited to a midshipman's ball at the community building. And then that was the old USO building. It had not burned. Um, so it was a smaller building than what's there now. But it was such a great thing because all of us went to buy our formal dresses and we got to dance with the cadets and 
later we went out with them and played tennis and got to know them a little bit better, walking them around town. But that was quite a highlight for Southport girls, and everybody was invited. Of course, my mother said she wanted to go, but she couldn't. <laughs> she probably would have had a better time than me because I was fairly shy. Your mother shared stories about going to the USO dances when she was a child. Well, she used to sing for the for the sailors. So. <laughs> um, but anyway, it was it was fun. Did you go, Mary Ellen? Yes, I, I did. Yeah, I uh -huh. thought you. Yeah, you can probably add on to that story, but yeah, was, I, you covered it perfectly. Well, it, it was a lot of fun for the young girls in Southport. It was. Uh, Mary Ellen, do you have a story you would like to share? Uh, you know, I didn't, but I just remembered one that we touched on briefly the other day. When I was in the first grade, the USS North Carolina uh, mm -hmm. was brought to Wilmington, and I remember uh, the school kids. We took milk cartons and covered them with uh, with uh, with paper uh, to uh, and decorated, and that's what we used to collect pennies. And that money was sent into the state to bring the USS North Carolina to Wilmington. And I remember I was in the first grade, and uh, our teacher, Miss Norman, took all of us, and all the other teachers took the children in their class too. And we went and sat on the garrison lawn while it went up the river. And so I remember that. Uh, at that time, little girls couldn't wear pants to school. And I remember sitting on that garrison in a dress and the uh -huh. sand spurs got in my little hiney down there. But um, I remember at the waterfront, uh, that was a big day and everybody in town, you know, went down there and, and watched it go up river. It was quite exciting. Thank you, Mary Ellen. That is a good story. My, I like that. Mike Royal. Mike Royal. Um, I guess I'd like to mention uh, participating in uh, Little League Baseball. Um, you can probably only name about three or four people, and you've got the whole history of Little League Baseball coaches. Um, it was just a wonderful uh, experience, and this, the same people kind of stuck with it for years. Foxy Howard comes to mind. Uh, Gene Russ comes to mind, George Parker, uh, mm -hmm. Billy Drew, Earl Elwood. Those are all men that took time to teach us kids uh, how to play uh, baseball. And back in those days, uh, really all Southport had was a, was a Little League baseball team. You didn't have football in terms of Little League sports or a Little League basketball. You didn't have soccer, but you did have Little League baseball. And um, I got a chance to play, and uh, it was a, a good experience. I, I played at a time when I can remember the first girl played on one of the teams. Her name was Stephanie. Her name is Stephanie Stiller. And um, I, I remember she almost struck me out one time. <laughs> and uh, and the, the thing that's kind of unique about that time period uh, you had to make the team. If you didn't make the team, then you didn't get to play that summer. Uh, but I feel like that was, uh, I feel like I learned some lessons about life that way because, you know, the first two or three years, I did not make the team. And uh, I lived right there within walking distance to Taylor Field. And it's right there near, as you know, where the old jail is, right down at the end of Nash Street there was where Taylor Field was. And it used to have some bleachers that had a sign up, uh, home of the Southport Dolphins. And it also mentioned a group called the Southport Sailfish. And that was a semi-pro team that a lot of the local men played on. And I don't know if uh, anybody remembers that, uh, but that was a part of it at Taylor Field. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Donnie? Yeah, I'm actually old enough to remember a lot of that, and some I don't want to even mention because it'll give away my age. Uh, <laughs> uh, like I'd say, you know, I enjoyed this. I apologize for the unstable connection, but Bob, what I want you to do is send me those questions. I'm going to put it on a, a video, uh, everything, and I'll send it to you, and we can put it on a uh, the uh, website 
for the uh, historical society, but uh, it was a, a different time and a different era. Mm -hmm. You're right. Well, that sounds Bob. like a, a, a plan, ahead, Bonnie. Um, Appreciate it. Bob, we should yes. probably close with who were, yeah, the, uh, who were the characters that we remembered most growing up. Some of us would remember Potlicker, it was a dog who laid in the middle of Moore and um, House Street. So it was one stoplight in all of Brunswick County, and it was at that intersection. And Potlicker, would, he was a town dog, and he would lay under that stoplight. He actually belonged to Dickie Aldridge, um, and then Foxy Howard took him, but he really, he belonged to everybody. He was quite a character. That's my character that I remember. <laughs> Anyone, anyone else? Yeah, I want to thank, thank you, Catherine and, and, and Mike yeah. and Mary Ellen and, and Donnie, Donnie Joyner. Thank you, thank you very much. I think it was a good, it was a good time, relaxing, and, and we had some had some fun. Uh, before we before we leave, I'm, uh, I have forgotten, and I was thinking I would like to ask if any of the new if the any of the new members that are that are with us, I'd like to ask them to just to introduce them themselves, uh, so we get you know get to connect a name and a and a and a face. Hi, Bob. Yes. Hi. This is uh, my name is Frank Newton, and uh, the Newton family, the Pinner family, have a uh, a long history with Southport, and uh, Catherine's mom Trudy was uh, a dear friend of uh, my father, uh, along with Joby, which uh, we're, we're real sorry to know of his passing. Um, I was down in Southport two years ago, and the, the last day that we were there, my wife and myself spent uh, about three hours uh, walking through the cemetery, just talking and uh, discussing history and families and stuff. And uh, I'm uh, glad I'm back with the Historical Society. I was with them uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, and then my career took off and kind of separated, but now I'm retired and back as a member of the Historical Society. And tonight was a, was a, was a great night listening to everybody's stories. It just, uh, and I can imagine those four people growing up in Southport by their stories. So thanks to everybody. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Frank. I appreciate your uh, participation on our Facebook page too. I'm Jane Stern, and I grew up in Southport, as several of you probably remember. Maybe some not so great episodes. Um, and let's see, my dad was a river pilot, mm -hmm. and I left in, well, I was in high school, but I left. But I, I was in Mrs. Hood's uh, classroom, and she was never bad to me. <laughs> I will say that. <laughs> Um, I hung around, I don't know if you guys know him, but Jerry Dillsaver and Joe Feek, mm -hmm. uh, Troy Davenport, uh, Leslie Collier, well, Zachary then, uh, Ann Sutherland, mm -hmm. Ben Gregory, those are my cohorts. Gene, your I mother was a scout leader one year. <laughs> she was. She also did a lot in the garden uh, club. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I'm just glad to have you guys on Zoom so that I can actually interact with people again. It's a little hard from up here in Dillsburg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gene. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else out there? Hi. Um, I'm Chris Naveau and husband Michael Naveau. We're, no, we're new to Southport and new members. And thanks to you and Liz have enjoyed the, uh, and Linda um, have enjoyed a number of the programs the last six weeks as we've sheltered in place. But uh, happy to be here and feel like we know so much more and look forward to meeting everybody in person someday. Okay, thanks. Looking forward to meet you as you as well. Thanks, thanks very much for joining. Let's thanks all for joining and.